I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about traveling to Washington, D.C., including getting in, how the city is oriented, accommodations, transportation, things to do, where to eat, how much to budget, what to pack, what our weather is like, and the best times of year to visit. And thanks for joining me. My name is Rob. I'm a tour guide and the founder of Trip Hacks DC Tours. On this YouTube channel, I share my best tips, tricks, and hacks for exploring Washington, DC. You'll find a ton of links to other videos, playlists, and resources down in the description. And if you get some value out of this video, I hope you'll consider subscribing and heading over to triphacksdc.com for info about guided tours and more. Many visitors to Washington, D.C. will arrive by air, but many will also drive themselves and a few will arrive by bus or Amtrak train. If you're flying, there are three airports in the Washington, D.C. area. Reagan National Airport, or DCA, is the closest, just across the Potomac River from downtown. Dulles International Airport, or IAD, is about 30 miles away in Virginia. And Baltimore Washington International Airport, or BWI, is about 40 miles away in Maryland. All else equal, Reagan National Airport is the closest and most convenient. You'll get downtown the fastest and for the least amount of money. That said, which airport is best for you depends on a lot of factors, including the airfare, if it's a non-stop or connecting flight, and what time of day the flights depart and arrive. I have an entire video about Washington DC's three airports, including the ground transportation options once you land. If you're traveling to DC by bus or Amtrak train, you'll probably wind up here at Union Station, which is extremely convenient, just a few blocks north of the Capitol building and closer than any of the three airports. I also have an entire video about traveling to DC through Union Station with lots of tips and tricks. And lastly, if you're driving your own car, you'll want to decide where to park it. Hotels almost all offer parking, but at a huge premium. There are several good, safe garages in town that are considerably less expensive than the hotels. And I have an entire video with parking garage options. Once you arrive in DC, go ahead and park your car in one of those garages, because I do not recommend driving once you're here. It's stressful and unpleasant, and there are plenty of other great ways of getting around. All right, now let's talk about the orientation of the city and where many of the points of interest are located. Most visitors are already aware of the White House, where the president lives, and the Capitol, where the Congress meets. Almost directly south of the White House is the Washington Monument, the tallest building in the city and a very useful reference point. And directly west of the Capitol is the Lincoln Memorial, the most visited site in all of Washington, D.C. Both of these monuments are part of a big urban park that we call the National Mall. Right across the Potomac River in Virginia is Arlington National Cemetery. Northwest of the National Mall is Georgetown, a popular neighborhood for visitors. Georgetown, to me, is a shopping destination. But there is also a fantastic waterfront park, the famous Georgetown University, and the Exorcist Stairs. Also northwest of the National Mall is the National Zoo. South of the National Mall is the Wharf, located on the Washington Channel. And south of the Capitol is the Navy Yard neighborhood, home of the Washington Nationals. I have done live walks around these areas, so if you want to explore with me, check out the video description for the links to those replays. And if you really want to learn about the unique street grid in DC, I have an entire video on that topic as well. Okay, now that you know where everything is, you need to decide where to stay. For most visitors, the best spot to stay is close to the National Mall, but in an area with things like restaurants, drugstores, and other conveniences. North of the National Mall, the area around the White House is a pretty good bet. South of the National Mall, the hotels at the Wharf are my recommendation. And if you wanna stay in Virginia, Crystal City has many hotels and it's only a short metro ride into downtown. 
In fact, there are actually 11 areas where I recommend staying, and I have a detailed guide to those areas and specific recommended hotels in each, which you can find over at triphexdc.com hotels. Generally, I do not recommend staying way out in the suburbs and commuting in, which might be tempting, especially if the hotels are cheaper, but remember, they're cheaper for a reason. If you're going to do a mix of daytime and evening activities, it's usually best to have a hotel that you can go back to for rest and recharging before heading back out. And that's a lot less feasible when you stay really far away and commute. Speaking of transportation, let's run through some of the ways of getting around. The best way of getting around if you're physically able, is with your own two feet. Walking is free, and it will let you experience the city in a way that you just can't do from underground in the metro or in the back seat of a car. That said, for visitors, metro is a great way of getting around. You can use it to get to a lot of the major sites, like the Capitol, Arlington Cemetery, and the National Zoo. And I know, if you live in a place that doesn't have a lot of public transportation, Metro can feel a little intimidating. But don't worry, because I have a ton of Metro videos that you can watch to get comfortable, including my complete beginner's guide to Metro, and my do's and don'ts for riding Metro. Unfortunately, Metro does not provide access to every single area. Big holes exist in places like Georgetown and around the National Mall. But that's where the Circulator bus really shines. Circulator is a low-cost alternative to the standard tourist buses that are around. My personal favorite way of getting around is on Capital Bike Share. It's cheap and I think really convenient. But you do have to be at least 16 years old to ride, so this one might be better for solo travelers or couples, rather than families with kids or bigger traveling groups. We also have taxis, Uber, electric scooters, and a few other transportation options. So if you wanna see the full rundown, I have an entire video where I ranked every one of them from worst to best. Washington DC is known for being an amazing museum destination, including extremely popular museums like the Air and Space Museum, American History Museum, and Natural History Museum. Smithsonian also has lesser known, but still awesome museums like the Portrait Gallery and the Postal Museum. If you're an art lover, the National Gallery of Art is also right here. They have one building for classical art, one building for modern art, and a great outdoor sculpture garden. And the best thing is that Smithsonian Museums and the National Gallery of Art Museums are all completely free. That said, there are also a handful of private museums, including the Spy Museum and Planet Word. And let's be honest, these museums would be top attractions if you plopped them in just about any other city. But because they have to compete with the free Smithsonian museums, they don't always get the most love, but are nevertheless pretty amazing. The other thing people know Washington DC for is the place with all the federal government stuff, which obviously includes the three branches of government, the White House, Capitol, and Supreme Court but also places like the National Archives, Library of Congress, and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Plus other federal government run sites like the US Botanic Gardens, Old Post Office Tower, and Arlington Cemetery. Now, let's talk about the National Monuments and Memorials, which are located on the west end of the National Mall and the Tidal Basin. You can certainly wander around and look at all of these on your own, and it will be completely free but I highly, highly recommend experiencing them on a guided tour because there is so much hidden symbolism packed into these monuments that you simply will not get if you just wander around and see them on your own. And I have an entire video about why you should book a guided tour. And I'm not much of a salesman, so I'll just say, if you're on the fence, head over to Google Maps or TripAdvisor and read some of the reviews. If a tour is good, it's almost always worth the money. Now, most of the activities I've mentioned so far have been either museums or federal government sites. And you really wanna to try to balance your itinerary when you visit. Museum fatigue is a very real phenomenon, and it will happen to you if you go too heavy on the museums. If you're into sports, Washington DC has pretty much every single professional sport that's out there. From the obvious ones, like the MLB, 
NBA, and NFL, to the WNBA, MLS, and even professional Ultimate Frisbee. So no matter what time of year you're here, there should always be some kind of sports happening. If you're into theater, the Kennedy Center is a top-notch performing arts center. And if you're more into live concerts, there are many concert venues around the city, including three stages where you can see a show at the Wharf, the world-famous 930 Club near U Street, plus a whole bunch of others. And if you visit in the summer, there are all kinds of special summer fun activities, like free outdoor movie nights, river boating, and summer festivals. One of the most common questions that visitors ask is, what are the best places to eat? Now, I wish there was a single, simple answer to this question. But in a big city like Washington, D.C., there are always going to be far more great places that you can eat than you could possibly squeeze into a single trip. If you want to try some of the Washington, D.C. signature foods, a few that you can look for include half-smoked sausages, the most famous of which comes from Ben's Chili Bowl on U Street, Ethiopian food, and any Ethiopian restaurant is a good bet, or wings with mumbo sauce from a Chinese carryout. And if you're curious about mumbo sauce or any of DC's signature foods, I made an entire video that you can watch to satisfy that curiosity. Now, if you're looking for the best of the best of the best, you could start with the Michelin Guide, which has published an edition for Washington, D.C. the past several years. However, I recommend going with a local guide, like the very best restaurants in Washingtonian Magazine. Restaurants are constantly coming and going. Chefs move on to new and exciting projects. And the best place one year isn't necessarily going to be the best the next year. So that's why when it comes to restaurants, you have to keep up with what's fresh and not rely on any old or outdated recommendations. One way to try out a lot of different foods in a short trip is to sign up for a food tour. I always sign up for at least one food tour whenever I travel. And my personal favorite places to eat in DC are fast, casual restaurants. These are places where you can typically get a delicious meal for about $10 to $15 per person. So it's more expensive than fast food, but less expensive than a sit-down experience. And Washington DC really does excel when it comes to this fast casual. I have several videos on this topic, including my own favorite cheap eats. In case you wanna make a list and check them out when you're here. Now, let's talk about budget. How much does it cost to visit Washington, D.C.? When it comes to hotels, the price you pay depends dramatically on your specific trip dates. Most tourists assume that hotel prices are highest when the most tourists are here, and that's not really true. Hotel prices in D.C. are driven by both tourism and business travel, and tend to be highest when there are a lot of business travelers or big conferences happening. And I have an entire video with tips for getting a great hotel rate in D.C. So check that out if you want to go in depth. But in general, if you come to DC on slower dates, you can expect a mid-range hotel in the $100 to $200 range. But rates in the $200 to $300 range are not unheard of, especially when there's a lot of business travelers here. Another big cost category is your meals. Again, this depends heavily on where you want to eat. My favorite fast casual restaurants are typically in the $10 to $15 range. A sit-down restaurant might be $20 to $30 at the low end, and all the way up to $100 per person or more at the high end. If you go for those Michelin-starred restaurants, it could be as much as $300 per person. And alcoholic drinks at restaurants in DC are not cheap. For a draft beer, you might find they're in the $8 to $12 range. A basic house wine might be $10 to $15. And a craft cocktail, $15 to $20. You could drink earlier in the day during happy hour, and that would help you save a bit of money. And in fact, that is one of my suggestions in my video about how to save money on food and drinks when you visit DC. For transportation, I say budget $2.50 per metro ride, and $1 per person per circulator bus ride. 
a taxi will probably cost you between $10 and $20 for a trip inside the city. And Uber and Lyft, I suppose, should be similar, but who knows anymore because those apps have been going a little wonky lately. For things to do, the good news is that most of the museums and federal government sites that I mentioned earlier are completely free. And since you'll probably do at least a few of those, that will help you save a little money. And if you want a full-blown breakdown on all the costs that you should consider for a trip, I have an entire video to help walk you through that. When it comes time to pack your suitcase, the most important thing you need to know is that no matter what time of year you're visiting, you need to have comfortable walking shoes. You are going to do a ton of walking here, and no one has ever complained to me that their shoes are too comfortable but I have heard the opposite plenty of times. The type of clothes you need to pack will depend on the season. In the summer, you wanna pack shorts and clothes that will help keep you cool, as well as sunscreen, hats, and sunglasses. In the winter, you'll want a coat, hat, gloves, and scarf that can keep you warm. But remember, Washington DC is not Alaska or Siberia, and you don't have to go overboard with your winter gear. In the spring and fall, the key is layers. So you can add layers when it's colder and remove layers when it's warmer. I carry an umbrella with me every day, 365 days per year, because in DC, it feels like there is always a chance that it could rain or storm. And for more details, plus a few other items that you'll wanna consider, make sure to watch my what to pack video before your trip. Many of the most picturesque photos of Washington DC are taken during a very brief window when the cherry blossoms are in bloom. And therefore, some people unfortunately believe the weather is going to look spring-like and picturesque when they visit. And unless you get lucky, it might not. The reality is that Washington DC has four seasons. In the summer, it's hot and very humid. In the winter, it's cold, but rarely frigid and the best weather months tend to be in between, in the spring and fall. It does snow in Washington, D.C., but not a lot. We get about one foot of snow per winter on average. In the summer, there are frequent thunderstorms, especially in the early evening. And in the summer and fall, it's possible that a hurricane could pass right by Washington, D.C. as it goes up the East Coast. Though since we are not on the ocean, it's unlikely to be a direct hit. Washington DC is not San Diego, so really nice days are less common than just okay days. So if you get lucky and you're here on a really nice day, take advantage. When is the best month to visit Washington DC? The unsatisfying answer is, it depends. The busiest time for Washington DC tourism is spring break, and summer break. Basically, whenever kids are off school, there will be more tourists here. During the National Cherry Blossom Festival, which starts on March 20th and runs through mid-April, also gets extremely crowded. In fact, this is typically the single most crowded period of the entire year. The least busy months are January and February. Sure, there's less going on, but you will be able to experience the indoor sites with much smaller crowds. And my personal favorite months are September, and October, because you get a mix of smaller post-summer crowds, but nicer weather. Now, you also have to be aware of eighth grade field trip season. There used to be two of these, one from mid-March through Independence Day, and another from September through Thanksgiving. However, COVID really messed up a lot of school field trips, and honestly, it feels like there's field trips here now year round. But if you wanna know more about navigating the conventional field trip season, I have an entire video about that. And if you made it this far with me, I wanna say thank you. And I wanna know about your upcoming trip. Leave me a comment down there and let me know when you're coming and what you're most looking forward to doing. And whether you learned anything from this guide that will help you out with your planning. And if you think it might be worthwhile to sign up for a Trip Hex DC guided tour, you can do that by clicking or tapping on the Capitol Dome on the left side of my head, which will send you right over to TripHexDC.com where you can see all of the tours that we offer. Enjoy your trip!